Hello? Okay. Well, good morning to our online audience, wherever you are and whenever you see this thing this week. And uh, we just thank God for you joining us. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, as always, we're happy to have a, a presence that can go as far as the Lord wants to stretch it. And that's pretty amazing in these days. We've come a long way from the preacher who rode a horse from town to town to town in a circuit and could only be heard as far as his voice could carry. Mm -hmm. Now we've got voices that can carry the circle of the globe in, in a millisecond. So we just, we just thank the Lord for as much as technology has advanced, a lot of it is advancing his technology. Mm -hmm. And we just pray for the thank you for Speaking of technology, we had Mr. Technology himself here this morning. Yeah. Yeah. He's going to pray us our message. He is uh, quite endowed with the ability to do things on with computers. And uh, runs a computer operation for a very, very large company in San Antonio that actually has cables around the world. So we're happy to have him. Some of you probably heard him the last time he spoke, a couple weeks ago. And uh, we're going to turn him loose up here and see what the Lord has laid on his heart for us this morning. So, Lynn, come on. Good morning. How's the sound? All right. We can have the anointed volume control so oh, we can adjust it. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. Today's, I'm going to talk about one idea, but hammer it really home. Jesus did not come to replace one religion with another. He came to abolish religion and replace it with relationship. Come on, come on. And everything Jesus said and did illustrates that truth. So why is religion so damaging? Well, because it misrepresents the gospel and worse, it misrepresents who God is. That's right. Diane and I attended Eddie Smith's church once. He was the pastor of Alice Smith, the prayer leader. And he said, most American unbelievers aren't unbelievers because they've never been to church. They're unbelievers because they have been to church. And yes, been to life, amen. Amen. Yeah. Because what they often saw was not God and his truth, but they saw man's rules. Okay. Like no yeah. drinking, no dancing. God hates movies and makeup and arguments over hair splitting theology. Mm -hmm. Yes. And walls created by an us versus them mentality. Oh, it's true. And they saw that stuff and said, that can't be God, and rejected it. Well, Come they didn't on. reject God. They rejected man-made religion. Yes. So what is religion? Well, first, there are two things God hates. One, worshiping idols. Yes. We all agree to that. But second, trusting in yourself. Come on. And if you think about it, the two are really the same thing. Religions are all about these things. One, they center on man's activity, ceremonies and rituals and sacrifices and festivals. Two, a do and get paradigm. If you do the right stuff, you can manipulate the supernatural. Mm -hmm. Three, often fear-based. Unless you do the right stuff, bad stuff happens to you. You've seen that. And they divide. They separate people into insiders and outsiders. And they require a professional priesthood that knows all the details, so us ordinary folks don't need to bother. Priests wear special clothes, have special ceremonies, special titles, and special powers ordinary people don't, and they sometimes keep special secrets to themselves. Number six, a real emphasis on exact words and incantations. And seven, focus on physical objects in special buildings and holy places, and you have to observe certain special holy days. Let's compare that to Christianity. First, it doesn't center on man. It centers on what Jesus does for you. Mm -hmm. We believe and receive. We don't manipulate the supernatural. We have a God that gives supernatural gifts. Yeah. Big difference. Yes. We're not fear-based because perfect love drives yes, out sir. fear. Instead, we have hope and confidence. And incidentally, the Greek word for confidence is the same word that's used for Jesus coming again. It's a grand entrance. That's, in other words, when we come on the scene with God's power and his confidence, in that situation, it's like Jesus coming again. I mean, huh? yeah. All right. Christianity doesn't separate in us versus them and unites. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. 
We love non-Christians. What about priests? Well, there's only one high priest. We don't rely on professionals. Paul was an amateur. Sometime in your Bible reading, you might look at 1 Corinthians 9 that introduces Paul as an amateur. But in 2 Corinthians 11 and 12, Paul answers charges that he was not really a true professional. Because after he founded the church in Corinth, people that called themselves super apostles showed up in, in Corinth and said, you know, Paul was just an amateur. Don't listen to him, listen to us. Mm -hmm. Paul was livid. Mm -hmm. And two lengthy chapters in Scripture devote themselves to kiboshing that idea. You see, the word amateur means somebody who does what they do for the love of it, not because they're paid. Mm -hmm. That's the highest compliment you can pay to a Christian leader. And I want to honor our amateur leaders, Chuck and Peggy, oh, because they do what they do for the love of it, because they love us and they love God. Amen. I compliment them as God's amateurs. Amen. And what about exact words? Well, we in Christianity do have exact words. His name is Jesus because the Bible says Jesus is the word. Yes. And the word was in the beginning. The Bible wasn't at the beginning, but Jesus was. And yes. Jesus is the exact word of God. Mm -hmm. The Bible just tells us about, about it. Yes. And also, Christianity has no holy objects, no holy buildings or places, just holy people. Mm -hmm. Now, we all know that, but you may not know God has been fighting against religion since the Garden of Eden. Yes. You want to prove, turn to Genesis 2. Genesis 2, 17. Yeah. God was talking to Adam. He wasn't around yet. And he said, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Mm -hmm. Now flip over to Genesis 3, 3. And Eve is talking to the snake. And she misquotes God and says, yeah. Yeah. You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. What? Where did that not touching stuff come from? Well, there's three possibilities. Number one, Eve made it up. No, I don't think so. She said it with such conviction. I don't think that was it. Number two, they miscommunicated. They misunderstood each other. After all, Adam and Eve, you know, this communication's kind of new. They don't have much experience at it yet. <laughs> no, I don't think so. No, possibility number three. Adam misquoted God, adding his own restriction to what God said, and he just took his word for it. I think that's what happened. Mm -hmm. Now, that might seem trivial, but it's not. We think of man's disobedience as allowing what God forbids. But the bigger problem is we forbid what God allows. Yes. And we falsely teach that God's commands are harsher and stricter than they really are. That's religion. That's a huge problem. Well, what's the harm in adding restrictions? Like, hey, Eve, let's just agree not to touch the tree. <laughs> Nothing if the person that adds the restriction identifies it as his own opinion. Yes. But falsely quoting it as God's command puts himself in the place of God. Yes. That misrepresents God. And that's the basis of building a religion where man makes up its own rules. Right. It might use God's word as a starting point. But man makes the final decision about what's right and wrong. Jesus had very harsh words for that. In Matthew 15, 9, he quotes Isaiah 29 and says, and this is from the complete Jewish Bible, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far away from me. Their worship of me is useless because they teach man-made rules as if they were doctrines. Jesus absolutely hates that. Falsely claiming that man's word is God's word is unacceptable in the Old Testament and the New Testament. But that's exactly what Adam did. Now, if God is love and he does everything in love, yes. why put the tree there in the first place? Wouldn't it have been more loving just to leave it out so that Adam and Eve would never sin? Mm -hmm. The answer is that before they ever ate from the tree, Adam and Eve were already treading a path away from God toward man-made religion with man-made rules. If the snake and fruit thing had never happened, they would have continued drifting away from God, 
all the while being deluded into thinking they were still in relationship with God. The tree had a purpose. Its purpose was not to get them to sin. That piece of fruit with the two bites out of it eliminated any plausible deniability. Their sin was obvious to them. The purpose of the tree was not to get them to the sin. It was to reveal the sin that was already inside of them. Uh, Let that sink in for a minute. Let's think about the tree was not named the tree of rebellion, hate, violence, sexual sin, etc., but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That word knowledge means to know good and evil by experiencing them both. In other words, you try good, you try evil, and decide for yourself which of the two you like best and where you draw the line between them. Their motive for taking the fruit was to get that knowledge so they could choose between good and evil for themselves and leave God out of it. Remember what God hates, idols and trusting in yourself, right. both of which are the basis of man-made religion. So taking the fruit was essentially a religious act. Think about that. God's main problem with sinful man is not immorality. It's deeper than that. God's problem is with man trusting himself to decide what's best for him. Because his trust is in himself, he will always let himself down, which is why people do things that are wrong. The problem is not bad behavior. It's putting trust in the wrong place. Trusting in someone that's not trustworthy, and that's me. Mm -hmm. You see that? Now, from the Garden of Eden, we move through history into a world filled with religion, but not filled with God. Every culture has its idols and myths and ceremonies. But in Scripture, the people closest to God weren't religious. Abraham was a friend of God. Mm -hmm. Nothing religious about friendship. No. Moses talked with God face to face. Mm -hmm. David was a man after God's own heart. None of these guys were religious, but all of them had one thing in common. They highly valued their relationship with God. <laughs> you go and read their stories. It's all about relationship. Now, let's compare that to the disaster of Mount Sinai. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Exodus 20, and verse 18. Now, the people were all gathered together to hear the Lord. Now, when all the people saw the thunder and flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled, and they stood far off and said to Moses, You speak to us and we will listen, but don't let God speak to us lest we die. In other words, like I said last time, don't talk to us, talk to our lawyer. All right. Mm -hmm. And by their own words, Israel locked themselves out of hearing God and into obeying strict law. Later, in, in Exodus 24, 7, they made a promise they could not keep. Quote, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. Fat chance. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Because a very short time later, while Moses was still on the mountain, the people did the golden calf thing. Turn to Exodus 32, if you can. And it says, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Get up, make us gods, it'll go before us. As for Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. Well, wait a minute. What about the God that brought you out of Egypt? <clears throat> hmm, now they're giving Moses credit for it. And Aaron received the gold from their hand and fashioned it into, with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow will be a feast to the Lord. What? What does the Lord have to do with any of this? He didn't ask for that feast. They had just denied that the Lord set them free from slavery and apparently forgot that the Lord's manna had just fed them that morning. Aaron knew that all this stuff was ungodly, so he tried to put a veneer of true religion over true paganism. That's a common problem. When people do evil, they claim they put a religious veneer over, veneer over it to make it seem okay. Like here in America, the Ku Klux Klan claimed to be Christian. There was nothing Christian about them. Hitler's soldiers, as they marched into battle, wore belt buckles that said, Gott mit uns, which means God with us. 
Uh, no, he wasn't. <laughs> Jesus correctly described this when he said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Beware of religious veneers. Just because someone claims to be a Christian or quotes the Bible does not mean the person's genuine. God looks at the heart. He gives you the gift of discernment so you can distinguish the phony from the genuine. Um, it would not be surprising at all if, like Chuck taught us earlier this year, the beast of the revelation claimed to be a Christian preacher. Yeah, probably. Yeah, you see what I'm saying? Religious yeah. veneers are very, very, very dangerous. Yes, they are. And people use them because they're effective in pulling the wool over people's yeah. eyes. And that's what Aaron tried to do by calling that pagan festival a feast of the Lord. Let's go back to Exodus 32, and I'm going to read verse 6. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, presumably to the Lord. And then the people sat down to eat and rose up to drink and play. See, those people, those rebellious people, tried to buy God off with offerings. You understand, religion is perfectly happy with offerings and sacrifices to God, but it always refuses relationship. God said in the Old Testament, that does not work. <laughs> Trying to use my phone as a time. In Psalm 46, it says, In sacrifice and offering you have not delighted, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. In Psalm 51, David prayed, You will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You would not be pleased in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. In Hosea 6.6, 6, For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God, rather than burnt offerings. In Jeremiah 7.22, For in the day that I brought them out of land of Egypt, I did not speak to your fathers and command them concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices, but this command I gave them, Obey my voice, and I will be your God. And you shall be on the people. See, a lot of people say, well, how come is it that in the Old Testament God had all the rules and regulations? Isn't that what he wanted? The answer is no, that's not what he wanted. So why do we have that stuff? Well, here's the reason. The children of Egypt demanded an Egypt-like religion. It's like this. They said, hey, God, we grew up in Egypt with all kinds of religions. We know what religions are all about. So here's the deal, God. We're going to relate to you like we related to the gods back in Egypt, and that's it. Take it or leave it, God. Now, what's a loving God supposed to do with that? Well, the idea of destroying them and starting over with Moses was considered and rejected. For the sake of keeping his promises, God had no choice but to give them what they wanted, a religious form of worship based on rules and regulations. They wanted man-centered rituals and sacrifices. Rewards and punishment. Uh, commands to obey, even though God commanded them love. They wanted something that separated insiders and outsiders, the clean and the unclean. They had a professional priesthood. They had the Torah. They emphasized the exact words. You know, Judaism to this day believes that God dictated the first five books of the Bible to Moses, word for word in Hebrew, including the account at the end of Deuteronomy of Moses' own death. And if you say, no, that was written by somebody else after yeah. Moses died, you're a heretic. <clears throat> you see how silly that gets? And there was a focus on holy objects and later on holy places like the temple. They insisted on that. That's not what God wanted. But despite endless warnings from prophets, we're going to talk more about prophets later. Good. Good. Israel always practiced a mixture of worshiping God and paganism. Because the golden calf thing, that wasn't a one-off. They did that over and over on the high places with altars to Baal and Asherah poles. Yes. In other words, the golden calf thing was actually the first of many. Mm -hmm. They tried to mix together worship of the real God and paganism. And after centuries of ignoring God's warnings, God destroyed his holy temple and his holy city his holy city, and sent his people off into exile. 
As the enemy surrounded Jerusalem and Jeremiah the prophet continually warned the people the city would fall, look at where their trust lay. Mm -hmm. They believed that no matter how far away from God they were, God would always protect his holy city and temple, so all they'd do was stay near the temple and they were safe. Mm -hmm. And God, instead, God sent them into exile far away so they could draw near to him. Yes. You see, you see the issue. Yes. They were near the temple and far away from God. <coughs> God had to make them go far away from the temple so they could draw near to Him. God will do whatever is necessary. Yeah. Right. So they did draw near to Him, at least in part. <coughs> the destruction of Jerusalem separates the Old Testament into two parts. Before that, there were endless problems with idols. After that, the idols were gone forever. Mm -hmm. That eliminated the first of the two things God hates, mm -hmm. the idols. Mm -hmm. But the second one, trusting in self, grew even stronger. Mm -hmm. In the centuries between the close of the Old Testament and Jesus' arrival in the New, Jerusalem suffered major persecution and religion became stronger than ever. Exact adherence to all the Old Testament laws and regulations became popular. And those who excelled in living highly disciplined lives were called Pharisees. They not only interpreted all the written laws of the Torah, obeyed them, but also the thousands of detailed interpretations of those laws that the rabbis taught over the centuries. Let me give you an example. The law says you shouldn't plow the ground on the Sabbath. So if a person needs to move a stool across the room on the Sabbath, the rabbis taught you had to pick it up and carry it. You couldn't drag it across the floor because if you did, the leg of the stool would, would divide the dust on the floor, and that was plowing the ground. Oh, right. wow. You see how silly and stupid it got? <laughs> now, let's contrast that between that kind of stuff and Jesus. Jesus was the most unreligious person that ever lived. Everything he said and did show how his relationship with the Father defined his life. Jesus used ceremonies and festivals as a way to reach people. He didn't depend on them as a way to reach God. That's why he attended them. Uh -huh. Jesus never did anything to manipulate the supernatural. Instead, he was filled to the, with the Spirit without limit, and the Spirit in him spoke the supernatural into being. See the big difference. To Jesus, there were no outsiders. Jesus instituted no holy places, holy days, or anything. And Jesus, who was the only high priest, wore no special clothes and claimed no title other than Son of Man. You see how unreligious Jesus was compared to the religious environment around him. He did not come to replace one religion with another. He came to abolish religion and replace it with relationship. And he illustrated another really good definition of religion. That which honors what God did in the past while it fights against what God is doing today. Jesus' entire ministry was a battle of God versus religion. Yes. You think about it, everything Jesus did, he was fighting against religion. Jesus' religion-free life is a perfect illustration about how God wants nothing to do with religion. Now, the church he left behind understood that. So everyone in that culture knew about a religion, so the first century church did everything it could to avoid looking and smelling like a religion. Let's look at the details. Number one, they had no defined ceremonies or rituals. Their meetings were home group meetings with a meal, singing, and sharing, although Jewish Christians did in some of their Jewish ceremonies. The emphasis was on the infilling of the Spirit, not doing stuff to earn rewards. They were not afraid of persecution, but they were known by their love for God and love for each other. There was no insiders or outsiders. They were all one in Christ. There was no priesthood, no special clothes, no special titles with unique powers. No emphasis on exact words. The emphasis was on the teachings of the apostles and the prophets. Mm -hmm. 
Lastly, no holy objects, places, or buildings. They chose to meet in ordinary homes, even decades after they grew large and wealthy enough to be able to acquire buildings. You may have heard that the early church never met the buildings because they couldn't afford them and they were scared of persecution. Not true. The persecutions were usually localized and more in Rome than anywhere else. Everywhere else in the empire, if the church had wanted to acquire buildings, they could have. They chose not to. They chose to meet in ordinary homes because they didn't want people to come to special buildings to be impressed. They wanted to go to the people to be with them. See the difference? So it's all about relationship. Consider the titles the early church gave its leaders. Except for one, none of them were religious words. Apostle. It just means someone who's sent out to accomplish a particular purpose. Suppose I send you to Raleigh, North Carolina, and I tell you, okay, I want you to go find some office space, sign a lease, and open up a branch office for our company. I want you to hire a staff, train them, and get it going there. So you go and do that thing. You're an apostle. You're sent out to accomplish a purpose. And while you're there, when you hire that staff and train them, you have apostolic authority in the sense you know what's going on and they don't. You know the purpose of the business and they don't. You know how the business is supposed to operate and they don't. That's all apostolic authority means. The authority you need to do the God job God sent you to do. That's what the word means. There's nothing religious about it. A prophet. We'll skip that one for a minute. Evangelist just means someone that announces good news, not a religious term. Pastor, somebody who takes care of sheep, not people with the stinky four-legged kind. Not a comp it was not considered a compliment. In the early church, pastors were mostly home group leaders, almost never a pro professionals. The best modern equivalent is a chaplain. Someone who primarily cares for personal spiritual needs. Mm -hmm. Teacher, not a religious term, just a teacher. The unfortunate religious word bishop in the King James is there for political reasons. I would, at a time, I'd explain what the reasons were, but it was political. The Greek word that it's translated from is episkopos, which just means overseer or supervisor. It was a business and military term, not a religious term. Okay. Deacon, somebody who takes care of a specific responsibility. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the example of Stephen the deacon in Acts 6 and 7. Stephen was chosen to distribute food to widows, but he did miracles and won theological debates, mm -hmm. not in his job description. Now, how many of you think that the reason that he got in trouble and God let him be killed as the first martyr is God was angry with him for exceeding the limits of his office. If he had just stuck to deaconing and feeding the widows, he'd been fine. No, not close. He was doing what Peter and the others should have been doing. Yet there are some Christian traditions today that put strict limits on what deacons can and cannot do. Yeah. That kind of stuff doesn't come from God. No. You see... God lives inside of me, and God lives inside of you. And when you're called to do something in the body of Christ, it's the God in you, the Jesus in you, the Spirit in you that's called to do it. Now, if the someone who is called is put in a box and told, do this this way and don't do anything else, that's like putting God in a box. That does not work. If you try to put God in a box, I promise you he will bust out. He makes it a special talent of doing that. If you take a person with God inside of that person and put that person in the box, the Christ in them will bust out. That's the way the kingdom works. Religion works by putting people in the boxes and making limits. The Holy Spirit blows that apart. And I'm glad that Faith Walk recognizes that. They let people preach. They let people lead. They let people grow in the Spirit. That's the way it's supposed to work. Yeah. 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 All right. Now, you want to know how far um, Stephen went beyond deaconing? If you've ever said, gee, I just don't understand the Old Testament. What's it really all about? Read Acts 7. That one chapter is a brilliant one-chapter summary of the whole Old Testament. 
you read that one chapter and you see the Old Testament from God's perspective. It's one of the most brilliant Bible teachings ever. Stephen, the deacon, was also a master Bible teacher. Mm -hmm. Wow. What about the word elder? Well, the Greek word presbyteros just means the older guy, not a holy guy. For mm -hmm. example, in the story of the prodigal son, the older brother is called the presbyteros, but he's hardly holy. Mm -hmm. Okay? The word just means somebody older, hopefully wiser and worthy to respect. That's all it means. Church. The Greek word ekklesia is the same as Spanish iglesia, and it just means the called out ones. And it does not refer to buildings or an institution. It refers to people in the world. That's what church is. Look at the, what these all have in common. All of these original words were secular terms with secular meanings. Over the centuries, their secular meanings fell away, and they became purely religious words. Religious words are very dangerous because their meanings drift around with religious fads. If someone's free to redefine the words, he can make a Bible verse mean anything he wants it to. That's how the words pastor and bishop came to mean things the Bible never intended. The modern idea of a church pastor doing it all, being the visionary, the leader, the planner, the organizer, the teacher, the preacher, the counselor, and the financial manager, is grossly unbiblical. God never meant for his church to run like that, where a professional does it all and everybody else just goes along for the ride. Also, religious titles like reverend just turn people off. <laughs> the Chuck's laughing. He's been there. <laughs> the only semi-religious word that the early church used for their leadership was prophet. But a prophet is somebody who throws a monkey wrench into the machinery of religion. Right. He makes the wheels come to a stop. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> she she heard my next thought. Religion hates true prophets. Oh, they don't mind predicting the future. That's okay. But when a prophet says what God thinks of the religious system, oh, no, it's disruptive. And you go read the Old Testament prophets. Most of what they said was not predicting the future. It was what God said about the present. It called out what it is because the prophet is the immune system of the church. Wow. You see, our immune systems recognize and kill infections in our bodies that don't belong there. Mm -hmm. Something gets in your body that's not supposed to be there. Your immune system finds it and kills it. Mm -hmm. Prophets are supposed to recognize and speak out against spiritual infection that gets into the body of Christ. Right. Mm -hmm. For the first 200 years or so of the church's existence, it was the same supernatural, world-changing body that it was in the book of Acts. But in the late 200s, that's about, yeah, as the power and wealth of the bishop increased and the liturgy became fixed, tradition began to replace the voice of the prophets. The bishops didn't like competition, so they suppressed the prophetic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The result was the church lost its immune system. Yeah. The church got a case of AIDS. Mm -hmm. AIDS is deadly. Mm -hmm. It could no longer recognize ungodly influences, and in the late 200s experienced a sharp spiritual decline. Every one of the church fathers wrote about that at that time. Mm -hmm. There were corruption and internal squabbles, even as the emperor Diocletian was running a great persecution against the church. In the early 300s, the church fell victim to Constantine. Mm -hmm. He was no Christian, but he was a shrewd politician. And he realized that the last and only strong, united group in a weak and divided empire was the Christian church. He knew Christianity was respected, so he used the respect for Christianity as a weapon to help himself win control of the empire. What happened is, the night before he was going to fight a battle, with his co-emperor Maxentius, he had all of his army paint a Christian symbol on their shields. This was not faith, it was psychological warfare. <clears throat> because both sides had Christian soldiers and Christianity was respected. So the Christian symbol on Constantine's shield spooked the soldiers on the other side and Constantine won the battle. 
All right, there's no faith in that. Once in power, Constantine bought off the church by giving them land and buildings. You may have heard of some of these estates he gave them, the Lateran and the Vatican in Rome. And he built the first St. Peter's Cathedral that set stood for more than a thousand years. Constantine made it known, if you want a promotion in the imperial bureaucracy, it helps to be a Christian. So, people were joining the church with the wrong motives. The bishops were busy raising money, building buildings, and competing with each other for status. And there were no prophets to oppose it. The end result, major spiritual decline that led to a thousand years of dark ages. Mm -hmm. Christianity had become a religion. Both the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches began to emphasize, let's go through the list, ceremonies, rituals, and traditions. Mm -hmm. Number two, a do and get paragraph dying, like you get rewarded for attending Mass on Holy Days and confession and penance and such. Fear, Christians lived in constant fear of purgatory. Unity, there was no unity. The Catholic and Orthodox churches excommunicated each other and both claimed to be the only true church. Nobody learned the Bible anymore. They learned the exact words of the Mass. Mm -hmm. okay. Books of canon law replaced the scripture. Mm -hmm. Their professional priesthood claimed a monopoly on spiritual power and believers were told to ven venerate relics and make privileges pilgrimages to cathedrals, especially in Rome. Christian leaders began to live and behave like kings, and the life and power of the spirit were lost. Satan rejoiced. His original plan to destroy the church with persecution failed, but he had a new plan. If you can't beat him, join him. He infiltrated the church and destroyed it from within. That's the power of religion. See how it took the wonderful thing that Jesus founded that turned the world upside down and killed it from within using by making it into a religion. You want to see how dangerous it is? Religion is responsible for Islam. Not Muslim religion, Christian religion. Here's what happened. Before Muhammad invented Islam, he was spiritually hungry, so he checked out both Judaism and Christianity. Now, the flavor of Christianity that existed in Arabia about that time, about the year 600, was Greek Orthodox. All services were in Greek, which was foreign to Muhammad, just like it is to us. They emphasized adoration of icons and relics that Muhammad considered idolatry. Well, Muhammad got that right. Mm -hmm. If a priest made an error halfway through singing the liturgy, he had to start over from the beginning because they believed God would not accept a flawed worship service. Muhammad saw nothing of the true God in that kind of stuff and rejected it. Look what he rejected. He didn't reject real Christianity. He rejected the religious thing it had turned into. You see, Muhammad's problem was he never met anybody from faithful. <laughs> because if he had, he would have found what he was looking for. Love, freedom, joy, spiritual power, and the abundant life that Jesus had promised. Because that's what he was looking for. And we have that. He probably would have become a great Christian evangelist because he had all the right material. Yet he was passionate and he was persuasive. But all he found was dead, rotting religion, and he rejected it. Thanks to Christianity being reduced to a religion, we got Islam with centuries of warfare, bondage, slavery, piracy, and terrorism. Mm -hmm. You see how dangerous religion is. It got so bad that in the Middle Ages, if a religious person, a priest or a monk or a nun, manifested spiritual gifts, it was considered normal and proper. But if an ordinary Christian used the same gifts, it was evidence of demon possession. Uh, churches didn't preach the gospel. They taught ritual and adoration of saints and relics. In the 1200s, Thomas Aquinas, who was a respected Christian writer, visited Rome. The Pope gave him a tour of the Vatican treasury and said, so you see, the church can no longer say silver and gold have I none. And Aquinas replied, and neither can she say rise up and walk. Right. Uh, <laughs> you see how things have deteriorated. Mm -hmm. Now, the Lutheran Reformation of the 1500s 
began the journey away from religion back to faith, but it didn't complete it. My wife and I grew up Lutheran, and she can tell you there's lots of religion still there. Okay, Other denominations have their religious baggage too. They spend a lot of their energy arguing over theological hair splitting. Here's a little key story that illustrates it. A guy was attending a week-long convention, and he just was cooped up in the, in, you know, the hotel and meeting hall. So he just went out to take a walk, and he saw another man taking a walk. I said, hey, can I walk with you? Yeah, sure. And as they're walking, the first one says, can I ask you, are you a Christian? And the guy goes, yes. He goes, great, maybe we can get together and have a Bible study together sometime this week. I'd love some Christian fellowship. Yeah, great. Then he says, hey, can I ask what kind of church you go to? And he goes, yeah, uh, the United Brethren of the Disciples. That's not a real denomination. I just made it up. <laughs> and then he goes, really? Me too. Wow, this is wonderful. Hey, you know what? Maybe our families can get to know each other. Maybe we can take some vacations together. And as they're walking up on a bridge, the first guy asks, by the way, does your church adhere to the original doctrinal formulation of 1889 or the reform of 1915? And the answer was the reform of 1915. And the first guy goes, you traitor to everything godly and holy and threw him off the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> You see how we got all this little theological hair splitting, and especially 100, 100, 130 years ago, churches in America were dividing into denominations, little sub-denominations over tiny little things. Yeah. Now, you see how stupid that is. Now, today, even though denominational barriers are fall, denominational barriers are falling, we still have religion. It's just more subtle. For example. Neither Jesus nor any of the apostles ever treat, preached a turn or burn sermon. But many preachers today think that the best way to get them into heaven is to scare them out of hell. The church has been accused of answering the question that nobody's asking. How do I escape the fires of hell? And so the church says, well, you should be asking that question. The problem is people really are asking questions, and we're not answering the ones they're asking. The gospel has an answer to everything, but we need to know how to take the message we have and tailor it to where that person is needing and feeling that moment. Amen. Lots of preachings is about morals, not about the abundant life or the power of the Spirit. You go through the New Testament, look for moral preaching on Jesus' part. You won't find it. Everything pre Jesus preached was about the kingdom of heaven, in the power of the Spirit. Professionals still run most churches, and Christian leaders often pursue money more than godliness. Many people out there judge Christianity by what they see and hear about TV preachers and who can blame them. Let me give you an example of recent history. In the U.S., many people wish things were like they were in the 1950s. Churches were full. Mm -hmm. Christianity was well-respected. Lots of buildings were built. Bus ministries brought children to Sunday school, and church youth programs and Christmas cantatas were very popular. But some years ago, an old pastor, Pastor Taylor, told me that his first years of ministry were in the 1950s, and he saw a dangerous spiritual decline. Pastors and members were pursuing programs instead of prayer, and everything was focused on human effort. The church was rotting internally, even as it was prospering externally. Then came the 1960s, the threat of nuclear war and the Cold War, the 62 Supreme Court ruling that banned prayer in public schools, the turmoil and violence of the civil rights movement, the tragedy of the war in Vietnam, the so-called sexual revolution, the drug culture, and pollution so bad it led to the first Earth Day in 1970. Christians were shocked to witness the decline in morals and respect for authority. We were genuinely surprised that heathen would behave like heathen. What do you expect? <laughs> if heathen could behave like Christians, then nobody needs God. Right. <laughs> the early church fully understood that, but the American church forgot. And we got a painful lesson. It's no wonder that America stopped looking to the church for answers because when the nation needed them, the church had none. In the 1970s, the church completely lost the respect it had in the 1950s. 
The fault there is not with the world, it's with the church. The nation desperately needed supernatural wisdom and power, and all they got was human wisdom and self-effort. In the midst of all this, there was the Jesus movement of 1971 and 72. It was a true revival with thousands of people coming to Christ, and it happened entirely outside of normal churches, and it was completely religion-free. Many of today's Christian leaders came to Christ in that movement, and I can remember it because I was in high school at the time. The traditional church was aware of it, but confused by it. They didn't oppose it, but they did nothing to help. God had to go outside the church to accomplish anything useful. You see how things have deteriorated. Mm -hmm. I don't want things to go back how they were like that. <clears throat> People will say, isn't it a shame that Christianity is shrinking? No, what I see is an improvement in quality. Now the good news. When any movement or anything suffers a decline, they ask, what did we do when we were successful that we aren't doing now? In our case, the answer is to rely on God and not ourselves. If anything characterizes the history of Christianity in the U.S. since 1980, it's a general return to reliance on God. Other parts of the world that only recently embraced Christianity never had a problem with relying on God, so they've seen steady revival and unbelievable growth. And I remember the, the huge revivals of the 90s and the last decade. Church in Africa is now majority Christian. Christianity is booming in South America, growing in China, because they never had a problem with religion. Yeah, and persecution did it. Well, what about you? How much do you rely on God and how much on yourself? A good definition of Christian mental health is 100% reliance on God, and that leaves 0% reliance on things that can fail you. It doesn't mean some sort of fatalistic abandoning of your responsibilities, just the opposite. It lets you face them head on because I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Yes. yes. Now, think about this. A Christian, remember we said talked before about uh, if a heathen could behave like a Christian, nobody needs God. Mm -hmm. If a Christian thinks he could be a Christian without prayer, he's saying, I don't need God. If a Christian thinks he can be a Christian without worship, without taking time to hear from God, he's saying God's not really necessary. I know in my life that was a problem for a long time. At its core, Christianity is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Yes. Colossians 1. God wants his glory to shine through you yes. exactly as it did through Jesus as he walked on the earth. He's your daddy. You can sit in his lap and hug him anytime you want. There's no nothing religious about daddy. He's his daddy. There's nothing religious about prayer. It's just talking to daddy. There's nothing religious about worship. It's just loving on daddy. There's nothing religious about church. It's just daddy's family reunion. There's nothing religious about sanctification. It's just becoming like daddy. There's nothing religious about faith. It's just believing what daddy says. There's nothing religious about prophecy. It's just repeating what daddy says. There's nothing religious about witness. It's just telling people about daddy. Mm -hmm. There's nothing religious about spiritual power. What's daddy's is yours. Mm -hmm. There's nothing religious about healing. It's just how daddy treats people. <laughs> and there's nothing religious about communion. It's just a meal with daddy to strengthen you. Mm -hmm. Holy communion is not holy because of the words we say. It's holy because a holy God gave himself to unholy people to make them holy. In communion, the real body and blood of Christ come to, through us through the bed, bread and cup. They don't become Christ, but they're the means, a means, through which Christ comes to you. It's a gift. Christ gives himself to you as a way to show his love for you. You see... God's throne room is inside of you. The kingdom of heaven is within you. Christ lives in you and you are filled with the Spirit. Communion is our opportunity for you to enjoy them and experience all their love for you so you can be filled to overflowing. 
But communion is for believers. And if you say, yeah, I, I don't think I'm there, well, the Scripture says we should examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith. If you're not in the faith, Daddy just says, come on, you're, you're welcome. Come on in. Not only do you get all your sins forgiven, you get to join the family, join the family meal, and just love on Daddy. There's nothing religious about communion. It's just us getting together and receiving the wonderful, beautiful gift that God gave. Jesus did not come to replace one religion with another. He came to abolish it and replace it with relationship. And communion is one way we relate. So we're going to serve now. I'm sorry if that sounded like I was reading and some of the had so much stuff I had to wordsmith it. <laughs> yeah. God is good. All the time. And incidentally, a first century church meeting, they held them on Sunday nights, because Sunday was a work day. So people would come after work, enjoy a meal together, and they communion was not a ceremony. They just folded it into the meal. I think that's wonderful. You see, the night that our Lord was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Every time you eat from it, remember me. And after supper, he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, because Jesus always gave thanks, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Every time you drink from it, do it to remember me. So thank you, Lord, for your body and your blood. If you want to experience more of what it's like to be part of Daddy's family, if you maybe have some religious baggage you want to get rid of, come for prayer. Because Daddy's family doesn't want anybody to be sick and hurting and incomplete. Jesus is the fullness of everything that God has. And he wants all of that in you. Thank you so much. Chuck, you want to dismiss me? Was that great or what? Yeah. How do you feel like you're sitting in front of an encyclopedic in <laughs> 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 <laughs>